James chapter 4 verse 6. James chapter 4 verse 6. Praise God, praise God. James chapter 4, verse 6. Got my clicker here. Give and he'll give one back to you. Like that song. James chapter 4, verse 6 reads, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Verse 7, submit yourselves therefore to God and resist the devil and he will, someone say will, he will flee from you. It's not a maybe. Verse 8 says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Mm, this is some scripture. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. God is giving us some direction. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your mighty word. We ask that you would allow us to have some understanding behind what you would like us to do, how you'd like us to live, and how you'd like us to walk. We ask right now for the word to be seared into our hearts and our minds, that it would become more important than our necessary food. In Jesus' name, when the church said amen, let's clap on to God one more time. Praise God in Jesus' name. You may be seated. Praise God. I'll tell you, I miss my wife. I love singing freedom. Don't get me wrong. I love freedom. I love it. But I love my wife's music more. <laughs> There's something that happens when you, and these men are, the people who are singing that song are anointed of the Holy Ghost. They are. There's a difference between singing under the anointing of the Spirit and singing on your own. There's something that happens uh, when that Spirit hits you. Uh, but I miss my wife. I miss, I can't wait till that baby come out. I had a dream last night that the baby was born. I got to see what it looked like. That's how bad I want to see it. You know, you get the, you're just like, wow, I can't wait. It's an exciting time. So, uh, we'll just pray that I want to wait until my parents are on their way back from Florida right now. They're coming to be here. They heard that my wife was having some contractions. Uh, but they're, they're normal. They're, they're, they're going to get probably stronger as it comes time. But, uh, right now it's not the time. But I had a dream also last night, you know, and this is going to be, my wife was scared again. Her crazy husband was going to preach some crazy stuff. Uh, but I was, had a dream last night that encouraged this preaching. It was something called a Helen Church. Helen Church. Could you turn that tape down, brother? I hear that humming. A Helen Church. This is not the kind of church we want to have. And I'm going to tell you why, and we're going to discuss it through the scripture. I had a dream that I was at this Baptist church. I think it was a Baptist church, but uh, I don't want to put down the Baptist, but it was probably a Baptist church. I was in a Baptist church, and at first it was, it was, it was a regular size. You know how dreams change, right? It was regular size, and then it got bigger as the dream went on. But... I was talking to somebody, me and my wife were there, we were actually in Boston, in the dream we were in Boston, we weren't here. And one of the guys was watching me while I was talking to another couple that was, I guess, visiting. And we were just talking to him and he looks at me and says, well, you know, said something to me and I'm like, I'm just talking. And then he asked me again, you know, what are you doing here? And I said, you know, I'm just here to listen to the preaching, I'm a preacher. And he stood up and said, thief! Or something, I, I, he was just but it was in front of the whole church. And, and the pastor got no, he was like, yeah, they threw me out because they said I was trying to steal these people from their church. Well, first of all, I'm in Boston. I mean, I'm not in New Mexico. I was trying to explain to these people. I don't, there's not even any place around here that I could take them. I'm just here. I'm just visiting. I couldn't believe they just were so, they were crazy, real possessive and real nervous. And it was weird. But then <clears throat> I came back and had a conversation with them and, and, and I was, the church was growing and, and, and. Then finally, you know, when they, I think we finally left on our own because they let us come back, I guess. You know how dreams are very weird. But I had walked up to the back of the church and it became from floor to a, to a kind of uh, amphitheater type deal to where it was like a, a full, full amphitheater. And at the top there was a bar across the back. So you could go up and get a drink during church. 
go back and have a cocktail while you have in church. I'm just trying to think what kind of church would it be where you're allowed to go in the back and get a drink and come back and sit down. Now see we, we have drinks in church. You can have regular water, that's fine. You know, where it says no, please, no, good, no gum, no water. Oh, let me talk about the gum before I go on this. I found a piece of gum in, in that fellowship hall and I had to scrape it up. Someone else's gum, that's just nasty. And I tried to get it off. We need to eliminate gum. I know some of us are adults and so we think we're not going to do what the kids do, but the kids see it, the kids have it. We need no gum in this place, please. Everybody who's chewing right now is going, Yes, no gum. Anyway, but you can have water. And went over soda. But imagine if we, could, if we set up a bar back there. Now we, there's another type of drink you can have in church. It's called having a drink of the Holy Ghost. That might loosen you up a bit. You know, you have one drink, you know, when you have at the bar, you have one drink and you can, woo, you know, loosens you up. You have two drinks and you look side. You, know, you got three drinks, you're up on you, woo! four and you're like bulletproof you know you can take on anybody so it's the same way with that that living water that drink of the Holy Ghost same thing you got one drink and you get a little start swaying remember that sway I told you about I never taught you how to sway then you get that second drink and you start getting a little step and you, you get, get like brother you know get the step going and then three drinks you I mean you're running aisles sweating four drinks you laid out on the floor speaking in tongues you know what I mean? you, you get a little loose drinking out that, that Holy Ghost. You, get, you need a little, it's, you know, because when people on the day of Pentecost, they look like they were drunk. So this is Bible. But it'd be a little different if it were a bar. If it were a drink of Hennessy or if it was a drink of, you know, a, a, a screwdriver or a shot of whatever. You know, I used to drink, what was that stuff called? It tastes like 44D. Uh, Jägermeister. I used to drink Jägermeister. We could, Jä Jäger, boom. Now, this room, the atmosphere, would ch just like when the Holy Ghost, the atmosphere changes in this room. But it would be a different change in this room if, if we were serving another kind of drink, whether it be an alcohol drink. It would, be, it would feel different. It would not feel spiritual. It would not feel like a place of God. You know what happens when you do that? That's when you're letting hell in church. I'm not talking about a name Helen. This is not a, you know, Helen Church is not what I'm talking about in terms of, of a name or, but we're letting hell in church. Now, I, I don't know any church that serves liquor. Don't get me wrong. I'm not, and, and I don't know any Baptist churches that serve liquor. But I do know people, I know churches, and sometimes it's this church, where people in their own lives, when you are not staying repentant, bring your sin to the church. Now, if you're in sin, that's probably the best place for you to take it. But if you're bringing it here to lay it down at the altar, that's a good thing. If you're bringing it here to, to repent before God and, and to rededicate yourself to God, that's good. But when you're bringing your hell in church to cause more hell or to spread hell or to, to not be repented but to come in and sit with your sin and hold on to it, you're bringing hell in church. What do you think sin's all about? First of all, where does sin come from? It comes from the devil. It's all about the devil. Now, I'm not suggesting at any point that we ever have any services that are like people drunk on liquor. We don't. But what I want to spark our mind to is how much are we willing to bring in sin to the church and not repent? And what does it mean to bring sin into the church? Not to lay on the altar. But we become a person who's just going through the motions and we're having our sin and we're not letting it go to God. Let's talk about the Word of God because what we want to do is we want to get the hell out of church. Now I'm not telling you to leave and I'm not cursing. I'm saying hell needs to get out. Hell cannot be here. Hell is not welcome here. Hell is never going to be accepted here. What we are going to do is push hell right out the door. Can I get an amen? Hell is not going to stay here. Now when people bring in, there's a difference when some, a new convert comes in and they're full of sin, we're going to get the hell out of them. That's our whole goal is to get hell out and bring the spirit in. Somebody say amen. This is not going to be a hell in church. Now, 
Let me tell you why I, I told you that. When I left that church in my dream, there was, a, you know, the bar in the back. And, and my wife and I were walking and we saw a sign. And the sign wasn't for the church in the dream, but it was supposed to be. Don't ask me how that works. We saw a sign and it wasn't on the church, but it was the church name. Go figure. And the church was the Helen Church. And my wife and I in the dream were discussing how you, we cannot allow hell to inhabit itself in here. This is a place where you can recycle. You can bring it and leave it in the trash can of the Lord. But you cannot let it fester in your lives. Let's go ahead and talk about the word here. It says that he that giveth, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore he said, God resists the proud, but he give grace unto the humble. One of the reasons why we end up holding on to our sin is because of our pride. That denial. You know, we got something in our lives that's not supposed to be there. Remember we talked about that's one of the self-inflicted injuries of spiritual suicide. When you allow something to stay attached to you that needs to go, it's like a growth. What happens if, if cancer attaches itself to you and you don't work to get it out? What's it going to do? It infests the whole body. Now, this is a teaching for you and for us to make sure for future, there's, I'm not preaching on anybody in here is full of sin and is, is spreading through the whole church. That's not what's happening. But what I'm talking about is preventing that from happening in the future. Each one of us is responsible to bring our repentant selves to the house of God. And if you're not repentant, your next job is to bring yourself in and repent when you get to church. Don't wait till the preaching. Don't wait till the altar call. When the first note comes out of the music, you need to be right up in here, hands up, face to the ground or face to the Lord. Giving it to God. That's what we're designed to do here. And when we do that, there's another thing that I'm trying to develop in this church. Is that level of, you know how excited we were about freedom? That's just a portion. Sister, you haven't seen us do that song. That's just a portion of how we get when the Holy Ghost comes upon us. We have hit much higher levels. Where's, where's Sister Cash at? When her husband, I'm speaking of faith, comes in this place, he's quiet. He is just as quiet. You might not ever hear him say two words in a whole time you're with him. But let the Holy Ghost get a hold of him. He'll be the loudest. He'll outshout all of you guys. That's what I'm here to tell you, church. We need to take this church to another level. And I'm, I'm, getting ready to, I'm getting ready to plant a seed. We're getting ready to build the foundation to the point where we can preach on uninhibited. We're not there yet. I've got to, got, to, got to get us there. And this is part of it. We've got to make sure we don't have hell in church. We need to have... Oh, let me, let me get ahead of myself. Then it says, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. So how do we get hell out? We resist the devil. But you know what we always do? And this, I heard this from a preacher from a guy at uh, Pentecostal of Alexandria last week. I don't know his name, but he was a visiting preacher. And he said this to me, and he was so right. This passage of Scripture came from, reminds me of what he said. He didn't preach about hell and church or nothing. That, that came from my dream. But let me tell you something. We always go to resist the devil right away. I've been doing it for years. But what do we, what do we miss? Oh, Lord, i got to plug you in. Excuse me. What do we miss? What's it say before it says resist the devil? What's it say before resist the devil? Oops, let's go ahead. It says submit to God. So we want to we wanna jump right to resist the devil. You cannot resist the devil unless you have submitted yourself to God. That's worth, that's worth your entry fee right there. Just that alone right there is worth what you came here for. Listen, we come to God and we want to fight the devil. And I'm going to fight. If you haven't submitted to God in obedience, you can fight all day long. You've already let hell in your church and in your house and in your temple and in your sanctuary. And it's there. Resisting is going to do no good. Repentance is part of that resisting and submitting. You've got to submit yourself to God. What's the first thing he teaches? What is the thing that he teaches all throughout the scripture? Yeah, you've got to believe. Yeah, you've got to uh, confess your sins unto God. Yes, you've got to accept the Lord. But that's only the stuff that's the preparation. The next thing is repent. And then when we repent, 
This is the tough part. We got to stay repented. That's how we submit ourselves. If we're not doing, and, and there's other ways, but you know, you know what you need for you in terms of submission. I mean, don't raise your hand, but ask yourself, do I know what I need to submit to in God right now? What is it that I'm not submitting to God into my life? And most of you will know the answer. Fix it. Don't fight them. Submit to them in that area. That's where submission comes in. And then you can resist the devil. That's how we get hell out. We stay in submission to God. How do we do that? Where do we find out where, how, what to submit to? Where are the instructions? In the Word of God. If we're not in the Word of God, we're not submitting on to Him. Mm, praise God. And then once we have submitted, we have the weapons of warfare to submit. That's like going up to a guy, you say he's a knight and he's got, you know, the mace, he's got all the mail, the spear, the, sh the sword, and you walk up with your clothes on saying, S go away. You'd be like, for what? I'm loaded up. Now you put on, you get your sword, and your shield, and you get your own mail on, and get your mace, hook it in your back, get out of here. Now you've got some weapons of warfare. You have a little bit more influence. Uh, I was just taking a class yesterday, uh, myself and Brother Bill and uh, uh, his boss and Brother Randy. That's why he ain't here. It was raining all sick. He's sick as a dog. The first thing you're supposed to do when there is a threat coming at you is not to pull out your weapon and shoot. What's the first thing you're supposed to say, Bill? Stop! You have got to first, you, you're not going to intimidate anybody with the idea of just, you know, letting people do whatever they want. Or you can't let the devil do whatever he wants. You've got to tell them to stop. And then you have a chance to use your weapons. You know, you, 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 if you don't have any weapons, if I just said stop and then I pull out my finger, I'll use it. You better stop. What's he going to do? <laughs> You're going to come right at He's not going to stop. You pull out a 50 caliber weapon. Stop. <laughs> and I mean it. Now that might get your attention. <laughs> okay, buddy. I'm sorry, you know, you are no longer, you know, when someone goes to rob you and, and, and they're going to attack you and beat you down and take your stuff, when you have no weapons, you're not intimidating at all. You can beg them or nothing. No, give me, their intention is to rape, to steal, to rob, and to destroy. But when you have a weapon, it changes the whole scenario, church. We need to make sure that we have our weapons of warfare. The, the way that we get those weapons is submitting to God. Some of us are wondering, why am I fighting? Oh, come on, I'm talking to somebody. Here's where the preaching comes. Why am I fighting but I'm not winning? I don't feel like I'm getting anywhere because you have no weapons. If you want some weapons, submit therefore unto God and he will arm you and then you can resist the devil and he will flee. The devil's a punk anyway. He don't want a real fight. He wants to take out the weak. He, he doesn't want to take, listen, he, I was telling Sister Tiffany this, this morning. He, he goes up to people, us, us apostolics full of God, he likes to mess with us, but he doesn't like to mess with us long because he can't win. And he doesn't go anywhere, so he goes to mess with some weak, sick ones. He ta and he feels strong, he feels confident, and he gets more what he wants. He wants people to go to hell with him. He is, his, his fate is sealed. My daughter said to me the other day, same thing I said when I first came to church, it was so cute. So we should just pray for the devil. I said, no, baby, that's, that's not attention we want to give him. His fate is sealed. Praying for him will do him no good. It's done. It's over. He is going to hell. And he is going to take as many of us as he can. That is his goal. But when it comes up to a faithful, strong apostolic who has submitted themselves to God, and they can resist the devil, he'll go get some weak, weak sick ones. So you know what? If he can't get someone like me, he's coming after you. If he can't get you, he's coming after you. He can't get you, he's not going to stop until Jesus comes back. Period. So you need to understand you are a victim. Now what will happen is, what will happen is, he'll come, Mess with us for a while. He'll go get this thing. And then he gets all this confidence. And then he'll come back to us. Because he built this false confidence. Look at how many souls I took to hell with me. Look at how many I'm taking. Yeah, I'm going to go take on Sister Tiffany now again. And Sister Tiffany just whoop, whoop, whoops them all good. 
she got some help. Now she she was doing good before. Now she got some apostolic help. He's really through now. He says that's probably why he might show up because he's so mad to see you happy. He's furious. You got a man, you got somebody to help with your kids, someone to help you with all. Oh, and the man loves you. Oh, the devil's, I got to go mess with that tip. I'm gonna... And then Eric comes around. She's not alone, Bubba. Now you got to deal with me. Now you got to deal with me. So what happens? The devil gets whooped up on and he starts looking for somebody else. Don't be that somebody else. Don't be that somebody else. He's going to take as many. He's looking for some trophies. But if he can't get a trophy, just like any hunter, hunter's looking for the trophy elk. Looking for that trophy deer, that trophy bear. But if they can't get one of them, they'll settle for another animal. They'll settle for something left. They just want some meat or they just want to get something they can put on their wall. They will settle. Oh, but if he can get one of them trophies, hunters aren't going to stop until they get their trophy. The devil's the same way. He's not going to stop. But if he can't get his trophy, he'll take somebody else. Then it says, draw nigh unto God. See, now that you've resisted the devil, you can go hug daddy. Oh, you just go to daddy. You can go to, you can draw nigh to God. But now, he will draw nigh to you. But it all started with submission. It all started with submitting yourself to God. That's one of our, listen, come on, if you, if, if you, one of the people I was talking to, I was saying, if you feel like you're just doing that fight and you're not getting anywhere, you got to draw an eye on God. Draw an eye. Listen, we've, this, this idea of submission is not easy for us people in the flesh. For us people who uh, like to do things our own way, I'm getting myself ahead again. Let me just stop. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. How do we cleanse ourselves? There's two ways. What's the initial cleansing? In the blood of Jesus Christ. Who said that? Go ahead, sister. In the, your initial cleansing is in the blood of Jesus. Then what's your next cleansing? Well, that's where the, that's where the baptism, you get the cl blood cleansing in baptism. That's where that comes. Repentance. Then the blood comes and the Spirit will cleanse you every time. So there's the, the one is a, a one-time event and the other one is a consistent forever event that you do until Jesus comes back. Purify your hearts, and we can't be double-minded. Now let's go to Psalms 32 and 5. I want to skip. I'm going to come back to that because this is the one I was just going to tell you about. Romans 10:3 says, "For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, do we have to be ignorant of God's righteousness? We have no reason at all to be ignorant of God's righteousness. If we are, that's when hell comes into the church." And we don't have to be so. If we don't have to be ignorant of God's righteousness, but we are, and hell ends up in church, whose fault is that? It's our fault. We can't blame God. Can't blame the pastor. You can't blame the church. Can't blame the organization. You can't blame nobody, but it's our responsibility. It starts with me. I got to preach it. So once I've preached it, it's no longer my responsibility. I have taught the church what they need to know. The righteousness of God comes from his word. Why do you think I got these things up here? Why, why do you think this is here? Why do you think we come together every Tuesday and listen to the Bible to help you become more motivated in reading? It's the two weakest areas in every church in America. Praying and reading and Bible study. And it causes a lack of repentance which brings hell into the church. I'm not willing to have that. I've got to be the watchman. It starts with me and trickles on down. And it says, and going about to establish their own righteousness. Remember when I talked about submitting, this is where I was going next. When we, we have trouble submitting. Why? Because we rely on our own righteousness. What I say is right instead of what the Word says is right. And then we're not submitting to God and we're going to be in trouble. We establish our own righteousness. And then it says, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. There's that word again have not submitted ourselves unto the righteousness of God. Why? Because we've established our own righteousness. All of a sudden, come on now, all of a sudden I decide what's right and wrong, not the Word of God. I decide. My decision. We're going down a road that's going to be dangerous for us. And that's the whole intent of the enemy. To do what? To get you off the mark. 
you know, we went shooting the other day, and, and then that's preachable. You know, we, we, got a, we did one exercise. Did your shooting get better after you got the little training they gave? They gave us some training how we shoot. You know, pulling the trigger is a huge deal when you shoot a gun. Huge. You pull the trigger can change everything on whether you're going to hit your mark or not. So I was doing really good from, I was feeling kind of like Mel Gibson up in here. I was, I was pretty excited. My, I had the last spot and, and, and they said, you know, they call it center mass. And you know, there's a threat, you got to stop the threat so you shoot at center mass. And so they said you know, two to the body. Uh, we did two to the, first they said do one and we did one. They said two to the, two, oh I messed up, I said the body. See that I already messed it up. Two to center mass, you got to use right terminology. And we kept doing two for a while. Then he said, do two to center mass, then check the threat. If the threat is still there, then one to the upper level. You don't say head. You've know, you got to use proper terms because people, you look, they think that you're out to hurt people. We're not out to hurt people. We're out to stop a threat. So with two center mass, pop, pop, look, then pop, hit. I was like one of two to actually hit the top part. And then later I had like three, in a, I put a smile on that thing. I was like, woo, feeling good. And then when it came across, it was one that was kind of on the side. No, that was another exercise. I'll get to that in a minute. So anyway, it matters. Then they gave us a little exercise. You put two, uh, they took spray paint and they made two silver dollar size uh, spray marks. And they brought a little closer. Interestingly enough, I shot better from further. Because they said, put five shots into that little circle from here to about where that wall is. The first shot, the first shots were from about here. And then the next ones were about a little bit, almost halfway, about this, about that close. So almost halfway there. A little thing, and I shot five, and only one came close. The rest missed it completely. And so what happened was my, my, my trigger shooting was not right for that close to shoot. I guess I was doing better farther away. So they come over and they give you some instructions on how to squeeze the trigger, because I was kind of pulling it. And when you pull, it pulls the gun this way. And then your bullet goes that way. But if you just squeeze it, you know, sometimes people want to throw it. Like, you know, it's going to go there. You know, So you just squeeze the trigger and you're anticipating it to kick back. So you kind of push forward. There's all kinds of things we do. But what I do is I was pulling it to the right. So he said, just squeeze the trigger. Let it kick. You're going to catch it. And so I squeeze the trigger. And then they have you do five dry fires practicing. Practice is good. Practice is good, church. So then they give you live rounds again, and then a shot. Now shoot the lower one, five shots, four of them right around. That piece. Instruction makes a difference. That's why you got to be in church. Instruction makes a difference. And you know how he says, you know, you, you think you're shooting good now? You think you know how to shoot now that you've come to this class? You can shoot now? You think you're good? You need to come more because you're never at that point of perfection. You got to keep going. You can always learn more and get a little better. Once you get good, you got to stay good. It's no different for the church. We need practice. We need to keep going. And even we got to the point where we're doing well and we're living for God the way we should, then we think we're going to relax. Don't think so. We need to maintain our practice. And little things matter. Just a little pull to the wrong direction completely makes you miss the mark. Just deciding, I'm just not going to read for a while. Next thing you know, it's been six months since you read. I've been too busy. I, I can't pray today. These little things matter. You think that when I'm talking, oh, all he talks about is prayer and reading. Prayer, yes. And we're going to talk about it until Jesus comes because it's something that we've got to continually work on over and over. When we submit ourselves to, if I would have gone in there to that gun, gun class and said, listen, no, I'm sorry guys, but you don't know, I know how this is done. Thank you, I'll do it myself. Wouldn't learn nothing because I was establishing my own righteousness. I'll do it my way. These guys are the ones that are trained. How many people come to church and listen to the pastor and say, well, I know he said this, but I'm going to do it like that. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but I think they're in this section over here. No way I don't get in trouble. <laughs> no, I know pastor said this, but, but I know God, and, and I pray to God, and, and I just know that this is the way I should go. We've established what? Our own righteousness. Listen, I'm not teaching you what I want you to know. The only reason why I would want you to know is because it gets you a close relationship with God. But this is not from me. This is not what I want for you. This is what God wants for you. 
And because God wants it for you, as a result of that, I may want it for you. But it's not coming from me. I have no desire for you to do things that I think are good. If we had a church like that, we'd be in big trouble because my thinking don't always get us in a good position. My thinking has not always done me good in my life, promise you. But when I put my mind with the thoughts of God and the ways of God, ooh, my goodness. When we were seeking freedom, and I'm just thinking about all oh, the freedom that I have, and oh my goodness, I just was so excited looking at my life today compared to 10 years ago. The, I've accomplished more in the last 10 years than I had the 30 before that. Literally. Because of God. If we establish His righteousness, then we can have God in the church. But if we establish our own, we're bringing hell into the church. I don't want this to be a hell in church. Ephesians 4, 27. Could you let my, know, my wife know that uh, we're getting ready? Just let it, I mean, I have my own stuff anyway, so. Ephesians 4, 27. She'll just know that we're getting ready to quit. Now, I'm, there's more to this scripture than that's up here. But you're going to have to wait till Wednesday. I'm going to actually preach on Ephesians 4, 22 through almost the rest of the, of the chapter. I just couldn't add it today because it was, I didn't want to keep us that long today. Um, I want to do some teaching, some preaching, uh, but I want us to have uh, a little bit more of like 30 to 45 minute sermons. I'm trying to get back to that place where I was, where I'm not keeping us as long. Uh, but I'm here because I know our music is going to go a little longer. But I'm going to preach the rest of this on Wednesday. What is Wednesday not? Thank you. Wednesday is not optional. We need to be here. Listen, why? Because we're going to establish God's righteousness. He says to not forsake the assembly. We need to come together for our feeding. We need to come together. Listen, I can stay home and preach to myself and to my family. I can stay home and read. I can stay home and pray. But I cannot get what we got today and, and, and the sweat and tears that went out in this worship. I cannot do that by myself. I cannot do that with me and just my family. We can do that at a different level, but it's nowhere near what happens in the assembly. So I guess what I'm telling you is I need you. I'm not afraid to say it. You know, this, 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 this society wants to make it seem like you're weak if you need something or need help or need someone. I'm here to tell you I need you. I'm here also that you need me. You need us. You need it just as much as I do. If you want to have the kind of relationship that God wants to have with you. Wednesdays are not an option. Now, I'm going to preach the rest of this portion of Scripture. It tells us 